everyone, my name is Loretta Robertson and I'm an associate scientist here at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole. And today I'm going to talk to you about some of the research I do here on corals at the MBL. First off, why don't we talk about exactly what a coral is. Is it an animal? Is it a plant? Is it a rock? All of the above? None of the above? Well, if you said all of the above, then you are correct. It is an animal that builds a rock skeleton made out of calcium carbonate. And it has a symbiotic relationship with a photosynthetic algae uh, known as dinoflagellates, or you might hear it called zooxanthellae, or by the genus name, Simiodinium. Now what this algae does for the coral is it provides all of the food the coral needs to grow and rapidly build that skeleton structure that forms reefs that we can actually see from space, like the Great Barrier Reef. And the, in turn, the coral provides a home for the algae where it's um, provided with all the nutrients it needs and access to sunlight. And you might have heard in the news lately that, uh, again, places like the Great Barrier Reef, but all around the world, that reefs are in danger and have experienced what it, we call bleaching. Now, what's happening during a bleaching event is that delicate symbiotic relationship between the coral and the algae breaks down. And the corals then, without those dinoflagellates, if they go too long without it, it's essentially starving the coral and the coral can die. But it's called bleaching because when the algae are gone or the pigments are gone from the algae, then you can see through to that white calcium carbonate skeleton underneath and so the coral looks like it's been bleached. And even though we as scientists have done a lot of work on corals over many, many years, we still don't entirely know that process of what happens during a bleaching event, how the algae are related to the calcification or that building of the skeleton in the coral, etc. And so some of the, the work that I'm doing here is focusing on, on some of those things. So I'm really interested in how organisms respond to their environment and something like a bleaching event happens normally when the coral is, ex is exposed to warmer than normal temperatures. It, it can be exacerbated by other things, but in general it's a, a warming event that um, causes the bleaching. And we're also trying to understand that role the dinoflagellates play in why one coral species bleaches when one right next to it doesn't, or even another um, colony of the same species. The video that you're seeing here is an image that we took of a coral colony that was under temperature stress and uh, uh, using a fluorescence microscope we were able to um, really highlight those algae cells by causing that chlorophyll to fluoresce red. So what you see is red in the image is uh, those individual algae cells. And if you look closely, you can see them coming streaming out of the mouth of the coral. One important point I want to make that often is misunderstood, a bleached coral doesn't necessarily mean that it's a dead coral. It's just lost those algae and if they can get some back or they get enough food and the temperature drops back down, those coral can actually survive. But as I said before, if they go for too long without getting those symbionts back, then uh, what was a live coral then becomes a dead coral and it gets colonized by uh, other algae or usually the first uh, ones to start growing and then it's, it's just gone and the, only the bare coral skeleton is left. So you might ask, why would a researcher study bleaching in corals in a place like Woods Hole? 
particularly in the wintertime. When we think of tropical reefs, I think we normally think of some tropical island somewhere, white sand beaches, and coral reefs just, just offshore. Well, um, many of you would be surprised to know that we actually have a very own coral here in Woods Hole. Uh, it's actually the northernmost limit of this coral, and it's probably one of the largest ranges of most marine species that are sessile attached and can't, can't swim, because it extends all the way from Woods Hole down to the Caribbean. And so you can imagine that not only is there a temperature along that north-south gradient, so temperature difference, I should say, where in the tropics it's warm and pretty stable most of the year, but in the northern northern range here in Woods Hole we may get up water temperatures in uh, around 20 degrees Celsius, but in the winter time it can get down to zero freezing. And these corals, they are just like uh, most New Englanders are New Englanders. They're tough and they survive just fine. It seems like. They're also really, or maybe part of that is the reason why, but they're pretty easy to keep in the laboratory. They take food uh, very readily. The video that you'll see is a video of a single polyp in a colony of the coral that's found here, Strangia poculata. And uh, you see they, they take the food readily and grow happily even in small cups uh, on the counter and we can keep them in warm temperatures and cold temperatures and, uh, and better understand how these corals can and how they respond to uh, variations or changes in temperature. Uh, the other unique thing about this coral is that it's found in both a symbiotic and asymbiotic states. So a, sort of a naturally bleached state and a non-bleached state. And so what that lets us do is we can reinfect them with new dinoflagellates and maybe ones that are more resistant to higher temperatures and see what impact that has on the growth of the coral. Also here at the MBL, we've developed a lot of microscopy tools that can help us better understand what's happening at the cellular level. And so, for example, we are using light sheet imaging to really understand what's happening to these algae in the symbiosis during a bleaching event and during a um, recovery or uh, reinfecting of the, the coral uh, by these dinoflagellates. We're also using standard SEM or scanning electron microscopy to really look carefully at that calcium carbonate skeleton and try to understand how those dinoflagellates are impacting the structure of the skeleton itself and if there's some um, problems that could arise in terms of maybe a a bleached coral is going to be more susceptible to breakage by waves or storms. We can do that. Uh, we also have just started looking at uh, micro CT to really dive even deeper into the internal structure of the skeleton itself and try and, and understand the whole process from time zero when um, the, the coral first starts making the skeleton. We've also added some new tools to help us both uh, monitor popu local populations, uh, but also to bring that underwater wo world to people who are unable to get into the water scuba diving like I do. And uh, this is a, a clip of an artificial reef site that we have um, deployed out here in front of the MBL off Water Street and what it will allow us to do is both follow 
particular colonies over time and across different seasons to determine what their behavior is, how they interact with other species that are found on the reef, and also to see what um, types of organisms, including the corals, will settle on the new surfaces that we put out there. We've also put out a ARMS that's settlement surface to help us uh, quantify and identify the biodiversity of animals that, again, are associate with, with the corals in here in Woods Hole. So the structure of plates that you see in the video is uh, what they call ARMS. It's a autonomous reef monitoring structure that is standardized and deployed all across the world in different reef environments to better be able to compare and quantify biodiversity of especially more cryptic organisms that um, hide in all the nooks and crannies that a coral reef creates. So I hope you enjoyed the journey through some of the research that we're doing here on corals and um, hopefully sometime you'll be able to stop by and see some of these, these corals, these very beautiful corals.